Zechariah chapter 4. Now tonight, tonight going through the book of Zechariah on a Wednesday night, and tonight uh, going to be a little bit heavy, and so you got to listen to it on purpose. I, I meant to have the screens tonight. Both guys that run the screens are sick and can't be here tonight, but I needed to show you an image, but I'll try to describe it to you as best as I can. But Zechariah chapter number 4, and um, don't, don't know that... When, when you don't know something, there's nothing wrong with saying you don't know it, all right? And in fact, I'll show you that's biblical. I'll, I'll show it to you in just a minute. Zechariah chapter 4, Let, let's read the chapter. Let's read the chapter, and then we're going to come back and we'll go through it. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace upon it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Around this time of year, I, I began praying about um, a theme for the new year. And some churches will take a theme and they'll emphasize that all year round and have sermon series and Sunday school lessons and themes of their conferences. And for us, really, it, it really is just a banner and screen artwork, and we don't emphasize it all year. However, the theme for next year is something that I hope to be able to keep before us and emphasize, and it is the theme of witnessing. We'll put the church calendar out and you'll see it. But the theme is taken from Acts 1.8, He shall be witnesses. And if we emphasize anything next year in our church, I would like to see our church do more in the area of being a witness to our community. I'd like to see more people come out on outreach, not this Saturday, but next Saturday. I'd like to see more people saved. I would like to see us be more involved in more types of public outreach. And uh, I think that we all know that the church is to be the witnessing agent for Christ to the world in this dispensation. Uh, the responsibility of the Great Commission is upon every Bible-believing church. It's upon every believer in the church. It wasn't given to the government. It wasn't given to charity. It was given to the church. And the Great Commission applies to this church. We can take it personally, and I, I believe that. However, that was not always the case. Before there was a church, who was God's witnessing agent? Who who was responsible to get the gospel to the world. And God has always had a witnessing agent in the world. And in the Old Testament, it was the nation of Israel. Israel was God's chosen people, just like the church is God's chosen people. They were tasked with a great commission in the Old Testament, just like the church is tasked with a great commission in the New Testament. Israel was to be a channel through which God would send his revelation and his redemption, just like the church today is the channel through which God's revealed redemption is brought to the world. Now, there's a number of verses, and I'll just read them to you because I don't have the screens, but Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, 
even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land um, whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. First Chronicles 16, sing unto the Lord all the earth, show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among, that sounds like the Great Commission. It's in the Old Testament to Israel. Psalm 18 and verse 49, therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen and sing praises unto thy name. Psalm 96 and verse three, declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. Great mission texts, but they're found in the Old Testament. And salvation wasn't sent only to the Jews. The plan was always for the Savior to come and be the Savior to the world, but that he would come through the Jews. Israel was to be a holy people. They were to be a witnessing people. And the heathen, the Gentile nations, would come to know God by the witness and the testimony of the nation of Israel. Now the tragedy is that they failed in their mission. They became disobedient to the commandments. They became like other nations in idolatry and they were not effective witnesses. So in the Old Testament, you read about Gentile proselytes, but you don't read about many. In fact, I can't remember of any nation that came to God through the witness of the Israelites. Nineveh as a nation, well, city, Nineveh as a city came to God, but that wasn't through the witness of Israel. That was through the preaching of a backslidden preacher. So Israel failed in the Old Testament as a witnessing nation. Now, now there were two, two ways that, that, that Israel was to be a witnessing nation. One, by their message, and one by their living. They were to preach it and they were to live it. God placed restrictions. He placed laws on those people that he didn't place on anybody else. And you may not understand the reason for all of those laws and all of those peculiarities, but you have to agree with me that if they lived as prescribed by the Old Testament, they would be noticeably different from the rest of the world. They were to be a holy people, and you can't be a holy people if you just live like everybody else. None of this closet Christianity stuff, none of this secret discipleship, win them by, no, no, none of that. And when you looked at a Jew in the Old Testament, he was dressed differently, he abstained from some things, he practiced some things, and his lifestyle said that I am different because my God is different. And God intended for them to be a light to the world by what they said and by how they lived. The church today is a witnessing people, right? And we are to be a message to the world by our message and by our lives. And by the way, if your life doesn't back up your message, your message is going to fall on deaf ears. And the church is largely failing because, because they have rejected the idea that we are to be a peculiar people in the midst of this world. We are to be noticeably different from the world. But, but I tell you that if you live by how the Bible dictates, you will be different. And the world will notice and your life will adorn the doctrines of God, the gospel of God, and your witness will be more effective. Could I get a witness right there? Dad was preaching Sunday night and he mentioned the church being a holy place and the sanctuary being revered and reverenced. I hadn't noticed people bringing food into the auditorium, but I agree that you shouldn't bring food into the auditorium and I would tell you why. You don't do in this place what you do in every other place. The word holy doesn't just mean sinless. It means to be sanctified. It means to be set apart. And what he was talking about, I, I sat there and I just jotted down some things that are sanctified, some things that are set apart, some things that are, you don't treat them the same way that you treat everything else. By the way, I believe that Sunday is a sanctified day. It is a day that is set apart. 
God set the Sabbath aside and it's clear that there were some things that Israel was to do on that day that they didn't do on other days. That day is to be treated like no other day. Now, now, now we're in the New Testament, I, I understand that. And, and we understand that the first day has replaced the seventh day and we're not gonna become seventh day Baptist and try to keep all of the laws of the Old Testament. We, 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 we know what dispensation that we're in, but we bring the principle of that day being sanctified over here. And I grew up believing that that day was like no other day. And, and, and there are some things that you don't do. It may not necessarily be sin, but you don't desecrate that day. I want there to be one day set aside for God and I want to discipline myself to not desecrate that as a holy thing. Somebody help me tonight. That's why I'm glad I work a job that I don't have to work on Sunday. It's a different day. And I know that sometimes you, you, you men get placed on call or emergency workers or whatever, but I wouldn't want to work on Sunday. And it amazes me that we grow our kids up and when they get teenagers and old enough to get a job, that we can let them go work at McDonald's on Sunday for minimum wage. Huh? Somebody, somebody talk to me a little bit, all right? Not a cardinal sin, not a cardinal sin, but don't be shocked when they grow up that they don't have any reverence for that day. That's just, it's just a common day, right, 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 right? That's why I wouldn't go fishing on that day. I wouldn't go hunting on that day. I wouldn't cut the grass on that day. Not, maybe not wrong to do that, but it's just a different day that was ingrained to me as a child. You don't treat that day like any other day. Somebody talk to me. I've always that, believed that church is a sanctified place. I know it's just a building. It's just a building, all right? But it is the building where we corporately come to worship God and we give it reverence by how we treat it. You don't treat this place like you treat every other place because it's different. That's why I still dress up when I come to church. You know why I came tonight? I came to meet with the king. I came to worship God. came to study his Bible. That's worth, that's worth putting my best on. Amen, amen, amen. So, tell me, tell me, help me a little bit, right? Huh? I'm not going to the mall. I'm not going to the park. I'm coming to church to meet with God. That's why we don't bring food into the auditorium. There's nothing in the Bible that says don't bring food into this building. It's just, it's just but, but it helps my attitude and it helps our spirit to treat it differently. Man. That's why I ask ladies not to wear pants to church when you come and you practice music or you clean the building, whatever it is. And I, I don't dictate what you do in your private life, but, but I ask that you dress modestly and by church standards and respectfully here because this is a different, it's a different place. That day is different. The place is there. By the way, by the way, the book that you hold in your lap is a holy book. It's different. And you don't do with this book what you do with other books. And I know that it's just paper and ink. I, I understand that. But the word on it gives us a reverence and a holiness and a sanctification. That's why I would never throw my Bible up in the windshield and let the sun curl the pages. That's why I don't think you ought to set any other book on top of the Bible. Because what book is worthy to set on top of the Bible? TV guide? Huh? I, 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 I just wouldn't do that. You don't carry a Bible the same way that you carry other books. It, it's different, it's different. And there's just something about treating it. You don't treat it the same way that you treat other books. I have three Bibles sitting on my desk at home. I don't know why, but I have three Bibles sitting on my desk at home. And every morning of my life, I sit down at that desk and I open one of them and I read it. And I'm working on memorizing one verse a day. It's just a holy book and it is to be treated differently. Now, now listen, it's a different day. It's just a different place. It's a different book. You are to be a different people. We are sanctified. We are set apart. And we simply should not live like other people. And your life should be noticeably different. There is simply some music I'm not going to listen to. There are simply some places I simply am not going to go. There are simply some things I'm simply just not going to say. And if we ever get back to embracing the fact that we are to be different, we are to be a peculiar people, it'll put power back into our witnessing. 
now, now, now Israel, Israel was to be a witnessing nation and they failed. They failed in their witness and they failed in their lifestyle. And they became just like the world around them. And when you become like the world around you, you have lost the moral ground to preach the gospel. God set them aside and he's called out the church as well. And the church is to be a witnessing people. Not Israel, but the church. And the sad thing is the church is doing the same thing that Israel did. Now you say, what has that got to do with Zechariah chapter 4? All right, wait, wait, here, here's what it is. Here's what it is. Zechariah chapter 4 is one of many places in the Old Testament that says that one day Israel will reclaim, reclaim her place as a witnessing nation. That what God originally intended for Israel to be aligned to the Gentiles will one day come to pass. They will be a holy people. They will be sanctified. The world will see it and nations will come to God through their witness. That's the message of Zechariah chapter 4. Now, here's what we've seen. Eight visions in one night. First vision, man in the midst of a myrtle tree. Second vision, four horns and four carpenters. Third vision, we saw the man measuring Jerusalem. Uh, the, the, the fourth vision, we saw um, Joshua, the high priest, clothed in dirty garments, and God reclothed him. And here's the message so far. Israel's going to be restored. Her enemies are going to be judged. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt and enlarged, and there will be a spiritual cleansing. And all of those things had a partial fulfillment, but ultimate fulfillment comes in the millennial reign. Now, building on that, we come to Zechariah chapter 4. Here's the progression in Israel's restoration. Not only will Israel be physically restored and rebuilt, and not only will they have a spiritual cleansing and revival and the nation will be saved and one day the Bible says that is going to lead to them becoming a witness to the Gentile nations. And that's what Zechariah chapter 4 is about. I'll break it down five ways. First of all, I want you to see the presentation of the vision. Look if you would in verse number 1. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and its seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, for some reason, Zechariah has fallen asleep in the middle of the night, I guess. The angel comes to wake him. He's going to show him another vision. And the vision that he shows him is a very confusing one. Here's what he sees. There's a golden candlestick. It has seven lamps. There's a bowl on top. There's seven pipes and two olive trees. Now, if you read that in verse 2 and 3 and you say, praise God. What a blessing. Boy, that really blesses me. You are a great Bible student. Okay? But if you read that and say, what in the world does that mean? Then you are in the camp of Zechariah. Because in verse number four, I answered and spake to the angel to talk with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? The angel to talk with me answered and said to me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. You ever been there? Nothing wrong with admitting, I have no idea what that's talking about. Now, now, here's what it's talking about. And I, I had an image to show you, and, and I, so I've got to just describe it to you. There is a candlestick. And you can imagine that candlestick's got a main candle, robber, robber, uh, uh, main branch right in the middle. And then there's six branches, so it's a seven-branch candlestick like you would think of a menorah. Okay? On top of that, there is a golden bowl. And that golden bowl, bowl is full of oil. Then from that bowl, there are seven pipes, pipes that stretch to those seven golden candlesticks feeding those seven candlesticks. There are thin two olive trees standing to the side, and I'll show you in a minute, there are two pipes from those two olive trees to the bowl. So two olive trees standing there, two pipes leading to the bowl, the bowl has seven pipes leading to the seven golden candlesticks. Now, that's, that's, that's the picture. I hope that you have that in your mind, all right? Now, that seven-branch candlestick would be familiar to Israel. 
But there are some things that are different that they've never seen before. For one thing, the bowl of oil is unique. In the tabernacle and in the temple, there was no such bowl. The priests had to come and they had to light those lamps. And so, but this one, the oil is supplied by the bowl. It's kind of like an automatic feeder. Right? The second thing that is different is the seven pipes. Now, now, some commentators think that there were 49 pipes, seven for each. I don't, I don't see that. I, I think there was just seven pipes connected somehow between the bowl and the candlestick that never existed in the tabernacle. Then the third thing that is unique, of course, is the two olive trees. If you look down to verse number 12, there are two golden pipes that come out of those olive branches. So those two olive, those two golden pipes from the olive tree to the bowl, so that's providing oil, a conduit of oil, to that bowl. They say that olive trees are the most oil, oily trees. In order to carve something out of olive, that, that the wood has to cure for years and years and years because it's so saturated with oil. So what you have is you have a seven golden, seven golden candlestick, it's providing light and there is no human involvement. There's no priest pouring in oil, there's no priest trimming the wicks, there's no, there's, it's an automatic process. And the only one doing anything is God, is God because he's the only one that can produce oil in those olive trees. All right? That's the picture of the vision. All right? The second thing, the purpose of the vision. And what I'll give you tonight is what nearly every Christian commentator says about the interpretation of this strange vision that we have. The candlestick represents Israel and her testimony of God to other nations. The candlestick is to be lit once more as a light to the world that God originally intended her to be. Now, here, here's something important. It's important that the candlestick is not the light. It is the bearer of light. All right? So who is the light? I believe the light is none other than Jesus Christ. Isaiah 49 is one of the servant songs in Isaiah. And Isaiah 49, speaking of the servant of Christ, which is servant of God, who is Jesus Christ, Isaiah 49 and verse 6, he said, It's a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, speaking of Christ, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel, and I will also give thee for light to the Gentiles. He's the light. Luke 2 and verse 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people. Israel. So Israel is going to be restored. There'll be a spiritual cleansing. They'll be saved. They'll become a witnessing nation and they will show to the world the light of the world who is Jesus Christ. By the way, that candlestick of Israel has gone out in this age, right? But God has another candlestick. If you want to write a reference down, Revelation 1 and verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The candlestick of today is the church, but one day, one day, the church will be removed, and it'll be Israel's turn again. So the candlestick represents Israel. Then you have the bowl, and you have the two olive trees, all right? Oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. So the bowl, of the bowl of oil represents the Holy Spirit. This thing is generated by the power of the Holy Spirit. You have two olive trees. And I think that ultimately the two olive trees speak of Christ. Look if you would in verse number 14. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones. Speaking of the two olive trees. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. There were two offices, offices in Israel that were anointed. Priest and king. Priest and king. In that day, Zerubbabel would have been the king. He was not a king, he was a civil leader. The high priest would have been Joshua. Do you know who the true king and the true high priest of Israel is? Skip over to chapter 6, Zechariah chapter 6. Now stay with me. Zechariah 6, look at you in verse 13. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. That's a king. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. Here's a priest sitting on the throne. 
So he's a priest, king. That's Jesus Christ. The two olive trees represent the two anointed offices, the king and the priest, and those two offices will ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So you got a strange vision, all right? Strange vision, hope that you get the picture. Israel's going to be a light to the Gentiles, and that light, that light will shine, that will shine will be the Messiah. Isaiah 62 and verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. See the vision. Seven branch candlestick, bowl of oil, seven pipes, two olive trees feeding the golden candlestick. Representing Israel is going to be a light to the Gentiles. In verse number six, you have the power of the vision. Come back to Zechariah chapter four, look at verse number six. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Now, Zechariah said the vision, the message is for Zerubbabel. He's the acting civil leader in Israel at that time. He is the one that is responsible for the rebuilding of Jerusalem and resettling the people. You can imagine the obstacles against him. You can imagine the people that would be opposing him. In fact, if you hold your finger there, come back to Haggai 2 and verse number 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Be strong, don't be discouraged. The rebuilding is slow, it's not glorious, and sometimes it's discouraging, and sometimes it seems futile and impossible. Here's a message for Zerubbabel. What's the message? This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power. Zerubbabel, this thing is not going to be done by human power and human strength. There is something supernatural that is going to empower this work. By the way, not by might, nor by power. Two different things. Might speaks of the strength of one person. Power indicates the strength of a group of people. Not by might, not by power. This great work is not going to be the power of a nation. It's not going to be the power of one great charismatic leader. The candlestick's already being fed oil by, by, by without no human intervention. And, and so, there's, so there's no human person that can do This is the power of God. By, by, by the way, by the way, I, I believe that our foreign policy toward Israel ought to be as a friend and a supporter to Israel. I, I, I believe that. I, I love the direction that our country is taking now. However, no president, no Middle East summit, no peace talks is going to bring peace to the Middle East. Jesus Christ is going to. No charismatic on TBN is bringing in the kingdom. Okay? No, he's not, no Christ is going to bring in the kingdom. I'm reading a book right now on, on the land of Israel by William Grady, Bill Grady, and, and, and talking about um, uh, the Zionist movement and the Balfour Declaration that brought to the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And he makes the point over and over, and, and, and of course that he does, that, that, that there was a lot of politics behind it, but it was God behind it. It's God that rebirthed that nation, and it'll be God that'll see it to the end. So, not by might, nor by power, watch this, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. By my spirit. Every single person in this room that is saved by the grace of God, you are saved under the power of the Holy Spirit. And every person that you've ever witnessed to that responded to the gospel did so by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every work of God that is done, you have to say it was the Holy Spirit that done. Ye shall be witness after that you have received, after that you have received, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witness. You better not get that backwards. Huh? By the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in training. I believe in programs. I believe in proper methodology. None of those things can replace the power of the Spirit of God. And just like in this age, when Israel repents and is saved, and becomes a light to the Gentiles, it will be the Holy Spirit working through that nation, just like the Holy Spirit works through the church today. Not by might, not by power, but by, by my Spirit. Look at verse number seven. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. I, I believe that the mountain stands for opposition, but that mountain is going to be flattened and it's going to become a plain. 
Whatever is standing in God's way of accomplishing his purposes with Israel is going to be flattened. And the headstone is going to be brought forth. The cornerstone was the first stone they put in the building. The headstone was the last building, last stone. It says the building is finished. And one day, one day the headstone is going to be laid and the work is going to be finished. And remember, when Zechariah came, they had been languishing for 18 years doing absolutely nothing, but the headstone is going to be put in place. And when it is, when it is, there is going to be shoutings crying grace, grace unto it. When God does a work, hard to keep quiet. I mean, when God does a work, I, I'm just telling you, I, I, I think it's bad. When you make more noise cheering for your ball team than you do for the Lord. We're not a shouting church, but a holy grunt would be in order every once in a while. It's not like wildfire is going to spread. If it do, we'll, we got people that will throw cold water on it. And listen, if you can't get happy and excited about serving the Lord and seeing God work, there's something wrong with your happiness. There's going to be some shock. I'm going to say there's going to be some Baptists that will not like heaven because heaven is going to be loud. Huh? When 10,000 upon 10,000 upon 10,000 see grace as it, I'm getting, it's not in the message, but it's here anyway, so here I am. When, when, I mean, when you see what God really did for you, I'm going to tell you that the most reserved, the most northern, the most Yankee of God's people is still going to shout. Look in Ezra chapter 3. Hold, hold your place here. Go to Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. Look at verse 11. There's always going to be some naysayer. There's always going to be tell you that the glory days are behind us and woe be unto us and it's not like it used to be and God's not moving. We can't have revival and we're just holding on to the end and you know, well, if we can just make it till Jesus comes. Huh? God help us tonight. God help us. Ezekiel, Ezra chapter 3 verse 11. They sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. This is the foundation of the temple and they got excited. Many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. Watch this. So that the people could not discern from the noise of the shout of joy, from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. That's just build the temple. What do you think it's going to be like when you see heaven? You shall lose all of your dignity. Amen. Come back, come back to Zechariah chapter 4. Got to hurry here. Got to hurry. Zechariah 4, look at you, but verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Simply saying the temple is going to be rebuilt. It's going to be finished in Zerubbabel's time. It says in verse number 10, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. That's an old English word for plumb line. Don't despise it because it just looks small. Just wait till God gets through with it. Then in verse number 11, we have the promise of the vision. What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? I've already mentioned it. Two offices of king and priest. By the way, these two in the last verse of verse number 14, they stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Lord of the whole earth, messianic title. Speaking of Christ reigning over the earth. Now, we know that the two anointed offices are the king and the priest. So there's a type of Christ here. But there's a cross-reference. There's a cross-reference to this passage that may point to something else. Hold your finger right here. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Still with me, say amen. amen. It's just Bible study, Bible study. Aren't you glad the Bible's not boring? No, oh, it's not boring at all. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 describes... 
144,000 witnesses. They're not Jehovah's Witnesses, Amen. though they are Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay? Amen. Not Jehovah's. They're Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're not. Okay. And they're going to appear during the tribulation. And the next time you see one that says he's pointed to the 144,000, ask him which tribe he's from. It could be 12,000 from each tribe. Verse number four, look how they're described. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Pretty strong parallel. Zechariah 4 verse 14 could be a prophecy of those two witnesses who's going to preach during the tribulation. It is in the book of Revelation that Christ becomes the Lord of the whole earth just like in the book of Zechariah. So, so here's the sum of the vision tonight. All right, it's heavy, but here's the sum of it. The nation is going to be restored and enemies are going to be judged and Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. There's going to be salvation come to this nation. And the natural response of that is to be a witness. And that's what Israel will be. And the power of the Holy Spirit will flow through that nation just as it does today through the church. In fact, look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7 describes those 144,000 witnesses that's going to come out of those 12 tribes and they're going to preach and they're going to witness during the tribulation. What's the result of it? Look at Revelation 7. Look if you would in verse number 9. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude. We're not in the church age right now. We're in the tribulation period. It says, I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. There's a great multitude of Gentiles that will be saved, more than can be counted when the great, when the great evangelist reaches to take place during the tribulation through the nation of Israel. In fact, look at Revelation chapter 12. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Verse number 17, great war, great war between the dragon and Israel. Verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's Israel, watch this. Which keep the commandments of God. And they didn't do that in the Old Testament. But they will. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony. That's the nation of Israel. And they'll testify of Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful thing to me to see this thing come full circle. Israel, holy nation, and called to be a light to the Gentiles. And they failed in their commission and God set them aside. He is calling out His church to be a holy people, to be a light to the Gentiles. And you could say that we're failing by the number of multitudes that's never heard the gospel. But on the other hand, I know a lot of churches that support missions. I know a lot of people, missionaries being sent out. There's a lot of people getting saved as a testimony of the church. You can look at it either way. But one day the Lord is going to take His church out. He's going to restore Israel. And they will accomplish the task He originally called them to be. And what an encouragement that is to me to be busy about the call. And to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit knowing that nothing is accomplished by power or by might, but by the Spirit of God. Strange vision, clear message, Israel, a light to the Gentiles. Let's stand together tonight, should you? Heavenly Father, thank you for our word tonight and being able to take this chapter. And Lord, with the helps of men who've gone before us to be able to have understanding and Lord, of end-time events and the Bible. Lord, more, more up-to-date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. And surely evidence, uh, Lord, written, written from a divine hand. Thank you for it. Thank you for the promises in it. And how that I can look at the promises made to Israel and I can take those principles over to the church and, and I can live by those principles. And so I pray that you've encouraged our heart tonight. Lord, I, I don't know what people come into this room with and the burdens and the cares of the weak upon their hearts. But I pray that you'd comfort them. I pray that you'd encourage them. Help us to leave tonight, Lord, with our spirits lifted and ready to face the job and the school tomorrow, wherever you have us. To face it with boldness and with gladness. And 
Lord, excited that we're a Christian, excited that we get to serve you. What a privilege that is. I pray tonight that you'd be with Brother Terry Kendrick and Lord, dealing with his wife. And Lord, told him last night, I've never walked in that valley. And so I can't even begin to imagine the pain of his heart. And Lord, um, without a divine miracle, Lord, um, she'll be coming home soon. And we know it's not always your will to heal. Sometimes you take your children home. And we don't question that, but I pray that you give Brother Terry grace tonight and give him strength, Lord, to walk through the valley that he's walking through in this night. I pray that you'd help us this week, Lord, to serve you and to live right, to have our hearts right, our minds clear, meditate upon the good things of God. Lord, to be different, to be different, that our witness might have some power behind it. Thank you for the message of this book tonight. I pray in Jesus' name.